Hey, welcome to the Gentle Rebel podcast, where we talk about navigating life's harsher edges with a spirit of compassionate creativity. I'm Andy Morton, I'm a songwriter and creativity coach, and I love exploring the power of gentleness in creating conditions for meaningful change from the inside out. Today, we're going to talk about being weird, <laughs> letting our weirdness out into the world, uh, and how this relates to the idea of belonging, you know, feeling like we belong, belonging to self. Uh, and the courage to be uh, disliked and stand alone. Um, it's going to be a ride. <laughs> uh, I find it really uncomfortable when I sense someone deliberately trying to be weird um, for the sake of it, or maybe because they've been told it's going to help them sell more of whatever it is that they're selling, uh, or it's going to you know, make them more likable or something. I, it's a bit uncomfortable because th- there's often this protective layer over uh, what is beneath a a kind of more authentic, genuine weirdness. (laughs) And they're conforming to some uh, image of what weird uh, is supposed to be, or like this kind of sense of like what weird is. Um, And it's a defensive, it becomes this uh, defensive, aggressive, discontented, insecurely arrogant, brazen, anxious, contrived performance smeared on the glass that protects the truth from feeling the world's air. We're all weird in very normal ways. The world becomes lonely when we try to appear normal in weird ways and try to be different in boring ways. We do ourselves and one another a disservice when we create conditional rules of being, but open up amazing things when we nurture unconditional belonging by allowing ourselves and one another to be unremarkable and ordinary. That's where the magic happens, when we stop trying to uh, stand out or we stop trying to stay hidden. We can breathe in sync with ourselves again. What makes us normal is what makes us weird. (laughs) The ordinary things we do and think and say are idiosyncrasies, routines, habits, things that we don't even realise we are doing. The meaningful stuff of eulogies. I used to be uh, struck by, uh, by that in eulogies. When I was an undertaker, I used to hear people talking, um, you know, after someone had died, talking about the person that they loved. And it was so often these ordinary, everyday, mundane things that they would speak of with such uh, fondness and humor. And these are the things that they missed, the things that, the, the kind of unremarkable things that made them who they were and made them funny and weird. We're all weird in very normal and unremarkable ways. In The Gifts of Imperfection, Brené Brown defines belonging as the innate human desire to be part of something larger than us. Because this yearning is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and by seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often barriers to it. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. And then later, in Braving the Wilderness, she described the quest for true belonging as underpinned by our courage to stand alone. So in this episode, I want to explore this idea of standing alone and how it relates to belonging to ourselves. What comes to mind when you think about this idea? Maybe the courage to stand alone with a sense of integrity and self-belonging feels like standing up for what you believe in. Perhaps it's doing what you know is right even when others are doing something different. Or to stop caring what people think and to follow your heart, your dreams or your passion. This is where we see a significant divide between belonging and fitting in, where fitting in takes us away from ourselves and into a lonely crowd. Belonging potentially takes us out of the crowd and into a place of inner integrity and truth. But the courage to stand alone, it's not always oppositional. It's not a position defined by what it isn't. It's also the playful, the silly, the foolish ways that we would engage with the world if it felt safe to do so. And so belonging and safety are intrinsically linked. It's the courage to speak from the the ball of sensation in the centre of ourselves. This ball of sensation is an image that my friend Alex Paxton referred to in an interview that he gave 
when he talked about his um, his album Music for Bosch People, and he said, um, you know, we get stuck in the metaphor of language, but it's the abstract sensation that connects everything. Art that is sensual goes straight to the ball of sensation that is in the centre of myself. This bypasses words. This is what is real. He was talking about his relationship with uh, things like art and music and the way that we express and receive and interpret creativity. And I really love this as a way to open the conversation about self-belonging and, and how we all experience and feel the world in different ways. Because language is this, you know, attempt, this imperfect thing that we have uh, as we attempt to make abstract things and feelings and sensations concrete. It's a mode of imperfection that helps us articulate aspects of what is real, but none of us can see the whole picture. And even if we bring our individual sensation balls together, we don't end up with the full picture, just a slightly different one that reflects the sensation ball at the centre of this particular collective moment. This reminds me of the uh, parable of the blind men and the elephant, which you may well be aware of. It's a very pa famous parable. Uh, a group of blind men hear that a strange animal called an elephant is in town. None of them know what it feels like, what it uh, looks like, you know, its shape and form. But they decide that they can inspect it. They can know it by touch. Um, so they, they go and find it and uh, have, a, have a little feel about of this elephant. Uh, and the first of them, whose hand is on the trunk says, uh, this is like a thick snake. An elephant is a thick snake. Another who whose hand reached its ear says, uh, this, it's like a fan. This is like a, a kind of fan. Um, and for one of the others, they found its leg and they said, an elephant is uh, like a tree trunk. Then one of them who found the side of the elephant said, an elephant is like a wall. And then another found its tail, said an elephant is like a rope. And then the other one, the final one, finds its tusk and says an elephant is like a spear. And I think this kind of is, I mean, there's, there's so many in different ways this can be interpreted and has been interpreted and, and it can be used to, to talk about all sorts of things. But I think we all experience life as different things, life as this elephant. We sense it in different ways and it's impossible to define other than by referencing things that we already know. You know, each of those people say it's like this thing. It's like the snake. It's like a wall. It's like a tree trunk. Um, and we might describe one aspect as if it's everything. We might say, and the elephant is a rope. The elephant is the tree trunk because we haven't seen or felt the rest of it. But an elephant is an elephant. It's a bit like a wall with tree trunks, ropes, spears, fans and a snake, but it's also nothing like that. So what does this have to do with belonging um, and weirdness? Well, I think we're all experience life. We all experience life like the proverbial blind men experience the elephant. We feel different parts of it. We can't fully describe our experience because we can just say it's like this thing that I know from before. And we might look for concrete ways to understand it from other people, or we might try convincing other people that we know what it looks like. If we can let go of the idea that there is a correct way of seeing, being, and feeling the world we begin to unshackle that ball of sensation in our core and enjoy the imperfection of language and creative expression to communicate what it means to be alive, to attempt imperfectly to express what it means to be alive. And the courage to stand alone is the courage to recognise the weird and wonderful ways we see and experience life and the world and to acknowledge and to surrender to the fact that we can never fully and perfectly articulate it. We talked about this idea based on Jacob Norby's book, Blessed are the Weird. Weird is obviously a loaded word, you know, and, and we talked about this in um, in the Haven in one of our Cotter sessions. Uh, and it's a word that, that can be a bit of an obstacle to some people. Uh, some people love it. Uh, and it, it, again, it's, <laughs> there isn't really a, a perfect word to sum this up. You know, we, we thought, what, are there some other words to describe what we're trying to get at here? Um, we said maybe authentic um, but to me, there's, a, there's almost a sense of essentialism to the word authentic in that there's a, an, a, an authentic self and an inauthentic self. Um, but I think that what we're describing is more of a self 
as a liberated process of becoming uh, ourself as a as a as a work in progress the freedom to become who we are becoming rather than a chipping away to uncover the true essence that is me my true self my pure being my core that is this like preset thing that i just have to sort of get through all of the stuff around the edges of and then i will find it you know i actually i find that a, a quite an imprisoning and somewhat hopeless and limiting and restrictive way to think of myself um but the weird it, it there's a it's a kind of nowness there's an awareness of what is alive in us right now, an experience of where we are and how we're relating to uh, the moving, ebbing, flowing sensations in the world around us through our ball of sensory engagement. And rather than shutting down our expression of that sensation, we place and leave the possibility of weird, authentic, real, playful, absurd, whatever you want to use as a word to describe this. We leave that on the table. And Alex, uh, Alex Paxton, who I mentioned, uh, is someone who sprung to mind when we were thinking about people who unapologetically belong to themselves. I've known him for many years, um, haven't seen him uh, recently, well, for, for quite a few years, but I've known him uh, since we were both teenagers and he's uh, always had this vibrant and unique way of describing things he plays with the sounds in music he's a, as a musician as a trombone player um, but also in language he's always had this way of playing with words the sounds in words um, and bringing sort of the vibrancy out of them he loves color he loves absurdist descriptions of things and his humor liberates and improvises and stifles conformity and he brings that out of you when you spend time with him. He invites and he invokes our authentic weirdness. And this approach exudes joy and beautiful excess. He's not attempting to explain life through his music, through his art. He's simply expressing something that speaks out of and into the ball of sensation at his centre. And that may or may not speak to the ball of sensation at the center of other people. This is his encounter with, with what he experiences as real, what he seems real, uh, the, the, the kind of attempt to speak the thing that cannot be truly spoken through language. And this speaks differently to all of us, but it's also the same. It's the thing that connects our weirdnesses together, a transcendent experience where we resonate with something we can't put into words. We're all around the elephant. We can shout our experience of it, but we can't fully grasp it. He's also massively good at what he does. You know, he's an unbelievably good musician and composer. And I think the quality of his work um, and the respect people have for what he does is dependent on his playful, his bouncy imagination. And yet he's not contrived. He's not playing in order to be productive. He's not playing in order to get these results, he's always exuded this wonderful sense of freedom to see things as he sees them and to express that despite knowing that, you know, many people will look at him blankly when he does that. But that doesn't matter. You know, he lets go of any drive to appeal to everyone. He knows there are many people who won't connect with what he does. There are many people who are going to hate what he does. Um, his music is not, uh, definitely not for everyone. But that doesn't less lessen his sense of self-worth. In fact, it frees him to jump even further into the, the kind of the chaos and the madness of his projects. He doesn't need to worry about appealing to those people. So he's free to do the thing that his kind of sensation ball is, uh, is knocking at the door asking him to do. So Brené Brown says that true belonging is the antidote to a crisis of disconnection. The crisis is deepened when we fail to traverse that liminal space between uh, particular groups. Braving the wilderness requires us to, to feel alone in the face of uncertainty, vulnerability and criticism. This is the definition of wilderness, when the, the, when the world feels hostile and like a political and ideological combat zone. But this is important because we become tied to the need to fit in, to gain approval and do what the group needs of us, which ignores this more resounding call for belonging that we all have. 
that we're connected by love and the human spirit. No matter how separated we are by what we think and believe, we are part of the same deeper spiritual story. This idea of belonging in the wilderness reminds me of a story about a Welsh rugby player called John Taylor, who uh, became injured during the 1968 Lions Tour of South Africa. Um, And South Africa were the best team in the world at the time. And Taylor couldn't train, um, but the doctors thought they could heal his right leg before the series ended. So he stayed out in South Africa. And while he was recovering, he had time on his hands to explore uh, the local towns and cities as the as the team was touring uh, the country. He says the more that he saw of the, the apartheid regime, the more incensed he became. He then chose to boycott future games against South Africa, uh, both home and away, um, for Wales and the Lions. And this decision that he made not to play um, had a had an impact on his career. You know, he was looked down on by the rub- rugby establishment and his fellow players at the time for bringing politics into rugby, which was something they'd been explicitly told you know not to do they believe this shouldn't happen this that rugby was separate and it should be this this thing that uh, transcended politics and so he was very much braving the wilderness with the courage to stand alone in this way Um, and in a very powerful documentary that came out um, a, a few years ago Welsh rugby legend uh, Gareth Edwards travels through the country reliving those uh, those um, Lions and um, Wales tours of uh, of the country and he speaks with South Africans who were excluded from the team because of the color of their skin and discovers that many people really see John Taylor as a true rugby hero during that time you know there were some absolutely amazing players uh, that they kind of enjoyed watching on the screen but John Taylor stands out as this true hero they talk about how he chose to make huge personal sacrifices for something bigger than himself he denied the the voice of external authority that said just shut up and be a rugby player prove you can be the best by beating the best politics is not for people like you it's for politicians and they're going to get this sorted out um when the british rugby unions um finally decided uh, not to play south africa it eventually happened where where they they kind of boycotted playing them it was a really significant part of that vast sea change which eventually saw the end of apartheid um, and it was this this huge wake up call. And as it turned out, rugby could and did play a part in politics. It had this impact in that in that sort of that move, that shift. But it needed people to stand with courage and sacrificial bravery. And Taylor testified to a truth that he felt in his heart and knew he would need to stand alone in the wilderness to carry through. When you hear the people in South Africa who feel se- who felt seen by uh, Taylor saying that you know he was the true rugby legend, he's he's the hero, the true hero. You see the true belonging that extends beyond the approval, the fitting in. He might have acquired other gains from staying away from that wilderness and keeping his head down. You know, he, he would have played in the against South Africa, the greatest team in in the world at that time. He'd have sort of tested himself, tested his skill um, and his abilities against the very best. Um, But some things and um, people feel too important for us to ignore. Some, uh, Some situations, some causes, whatever it is that is that, you know, that that kind of sensation ball again, that thing at the core of us that is just saying, this is this is you. This is the thing that you uh, that matters most is too big to ignore. So Brené Brown says the special courage it takes to experience true belonging is not just about braving the wilderness. It's about becoming the wilderness in the sense that once we disconnect from the heart of those things that separate us, we might become the heartland of connection with people who are different from us. She says we're going to have to sign up, join and take a seat at the table. We're going to have to learn how to listen, have hard conversations, look for joy, share pain and be more curious than defensive, all while seeking moments of togetherness. This is 
not easy. It requires enormous amounts of courage and vulnerability to get uncomfortable and learn how to be present with people without sacrificing who we are. These are the moments that change everything. It demands creativity, grace and patience to make it up as we go. Not to condone things we see causing harm, but like John Taylor, to stay in the arena having the conversations, explaining why we refuse to go where we're expected to go. To do that, remaining calm, remaining in a spirit of gentleness, forging a new path as we go. We can't walk anyone else's path to find our own. As Joseph Campbell said, if you can see your path laid out in front of you, step by step, you know it's not your path. Your path, the path you make with every step you take, that's why it's your path. This is a reminder that true belonging is not something you negotiate externally. It's what you carry in your heart, is finding the sacredness in being a part of something. When we reach this place, even momentarily, we belong everywhere and nowhere. That seems absurd, but it's true. Sometimes we are associate imposter syndrome with feelings of not belonging. As we look around at others, we might feel like a fraud or a fake in fear that we're going to be found out and exposed as an imposter. There's something quite interesting about this idea, and it's amazing how many people experience it. In fact, I'm probably more suspicious of people who don't experience it. It can be, a, and it is a healthy aspect of humility and accountability in collective growth and progression. I would much rather spend time in a group of people who all feel like imposters and know that the rest of us feel the same than a group of people who don't. An imposter is someone who intentionally acts to mislead others into believing they are something they're not, usually to gain something from that situation. It requires enormous self-belief and confidence. You know, it's where we get the term con man, you know, the confidence man, someone who has the confidence to gain trust belief and other people's confidence. Um, They gain all these things from the world around them. At its basic level, the imposter is acutely aware of their alienation within a particular context, and they deliberately act to encourage people's trust in their inauthenticity. This is very different from imposter feelings we might experience in everyday life. You know, imposter syndrome is the feeling that Uh, arises from the belief that we are not as competent as other people or we're not as capable as other people think we are. Um, In other words, it's the feeling that we don't quite fit. We're not supposed to be here or we're not, we don't deserve to be here in the same way that other people here deserve to be here. But as we've seen, fitting in is different from belonging. This is why imposter syndrome, I like to see it as a solution rather than a problem. It shows us something that's true for all of us. We often seek to belong by asking how to fit in better. But what if we only find the freedom to belong by accepting that we can't truly fit anywhere if we're looking for it? When we're driven by the desire to fit in, we might be seeking entitlement. We might not think of it as such, but we might want to feel like we deserve to be where we are in some way. It makes me wonder if there are are different types of safety as well. Entitlement is often access to material safety or a sense of safety through belonging to a particular group that gets special preferential treatment. Whereas the safety related to true belonging is an inside out safety where it's safe to be you. You belong because you're here. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be anyone. You don't have to change anything about yourself in order to be accepted. And the more that we deal in the former kind of safety, that first kind of safety, the more divided and alienated we become from ourselves, one another and the world, we strive to fit into the group that entitles us to a feeling of safety, a feeling of validation, a feeling that, you know, we deserve to be here. But a world built on that is an inherently unsafe and regressive environment. One of the things I love about spending time with people like Alex is that the safety to be yourself is infectious. This kind of safety allows you to take risks, to be vulnerable, to express yourself. It's not safety as as protection, but rather it's safety as permission. 
And this is a key difference between entitlement and true belonging. Entitlement is protection from vulnerability. It trains us to not express ourselves. It trains us how not to express ourselves. Unconditional belonging is permission towards vulnerability. It trains us to express ourselves. It makes us safe and free to do that, to fail, to figure out what it means to express ourselves. Conditional belonging and entitlement is this sense that you get certain treatment based on something about yourself. Perhaps it's because you pay the premium subscription. You look a certain way. You've performed a particular action. There are obviously many situations where this is just par for the course. But when we set up our entire understanding of society or a community around this idea, we end up really limiting who we are, who we're capable of being, how we express ourselves, the possibilities, the potentials, the capabilities of individuals and the collective. One potential offshoot of conditional belonging is fear of failing and perfectionism, where we become overtaken by the potential consequences of messing up. And we seek kind of wholeness through making everything just right. What is perfection? Other than rather difficult to describe. I came across this definition that perfection is the action or process of improving something until it's faultless, which is quite sort of like, okay, that's, yeah, that's quite extreme. Um, so what is faultless? How, what does faultless even mean? Um, I remember a while back I was ordering a pizza um, and a message popped up on the website I ordered it from that said, uh, your pizza is being baked to perfection. I was like, ah, oh, a perfect pizza. That's exciting. Um, I don't think I've ever had one. Um, and it, it, it turned out to be a pretty bold claim. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible pizza, but it, it certainly wasn't faultless. Perhaps a little underdone to my taste. Um, I did really enjoy eating it. It was very tasty. But it was a reminder that we don't all interpret our experience of the world in quite the same way. Um, and the the only truly faultless pizza is one that doesn't exist. <laughs> it's one that probably exists in our mind. You know, it's something, it's something way out there, some, not something we could ever actually consume. And uh, I much pre- preferred to eat a slightly faulty one that did exist, that was in front of me. Um, and maybe that's one of the problems with conversations about perfectionism. One person's favourite is another person's like, ugh. The aspect that makes something beautiful to one person is the thing that makes it kind of unattractive, undesirable to someone else. We all have different definitions of perfection when we say, oh, it was perfect. My perfect day might be your idea of a boring nightmare and vice versa. Perfectionism is not about achieving a tangible outcome. It's an attachment to dissatisfaction in the face of our outcomes. Perfectionism is not simply a desire for high standards and top quality results. It's always in pursuit of satisfaction, but can never be satisfied. No matter how good it gets, it will never do quite enough. Despite appearances, perfectionism is not about producing quality. It's about the relationship we have with our belief in the idea of faultless. Perfection is like a black hole. It's a void made conspicuous by its lack of definition. We all know the void, the lack, the deep awareness that something is missing, and we all have different relationships with it. We do many things to cope with and respond to it. It's given rise to all kinds of amazing innovation in art over the years. It's why we've not all agreed on the perfect song, the perfect novel, the perfect painting, decided, ah, oh, guys, we can finally stop creating things now. We've, we've reached perfection. You know, however, however much we might feel that in a moment where we experience something, the next day it's like, okay, let's find the, ne- the next way of like, expressing ourselves about the elephant, expressing the elephant. Uh, what, is, what is this thing that we haven't quite worked out yet? That's why in sport, no matter how final a final is made to feel by the hope, hype surrounding it, 
there will always be another one. The sport is unwinnable at the ultimate level. It goes on even after the greatest of all time can no longer play. In many ways, this sense of what is missing is the fuel tank that moves us, connects us and gives life its meaning. It's the thing into which we throw our passion, our care, our love, our energy, our time, our fear, our joy, our pain, our delight, our confusion and our longing. We all know it. We all feel it. But the one thing none of us can ever do is fill it or truly express it. We can't eliminate it. And yet, this is exactly what perfectionism tells us we can do, or at least has us believing in. It promises that we can earn our way to the impossible utopia of lasting satisfaction, completeness, uh, acceptance, worthiness, happiness, just as long as we don't make any mistakes. It has us believe that we can be happy once we find the perfect partner, the perfect house, the perfect car, the perfect job, the perfect computer, the perfect child, the perfect vacation, the perfect Christmas, the perfect wedding, and so on. As far as I'm concerned, perfectionism can do one. Its promise doesn't even sound that good. It's completely rubbish compared with the price we have to pay for it. I mean, all the things that give life a sense of meaning and make it worth waking up for. Passion, love, compassion, pastimes, risk, uncertain outcomes, art, experiences, story, overcoming the odds. These are all fundamentally at odds with the certainty, control and safety that perfectionism promises if we do things in the way that we are supposed to. What's more? The most meaningful and lasting stories and memories that I have are intrinsically tied to when things went, went wrong or things didn't go to plan. Why? Because these are times when I connected with people. I was awake. I was in the moment. We were problem solving. We cried together. We laughed together. We shared a moment of timeless understanding that the clumsy imperfection of ordinary life is what gives rise to true beauty. When I first wrote this um, as an article, I wrote uh, uh, an imperfect poem uh, to coincide with it as a response to these reflections on this theme. Um, And I recorded it and I want to share it right now. It's called An Ode to Imperfection. Um, And it's it is an ode to imperfection in all its vulgarity. Your pizza is in the oven being cooked to perfection. Really? says who? One person's perfect is another person's overdone or underdone. A perfectly manicured lawn makes me feel very uneasy, uncomfortable, unwelcome. World without blemish is a world concealing dark secrets, a world hiding truth. It's a barrier to entry and a rejection of my soul and spirit. I need loose threads, blemishes and stains. I like weeds and mossy walls. They're reassuring. An outstretched hand that tells me it's safe to be me. I can exist in this space. I will not be rejected for wearing the wrong thing, saying something out of turn or acting inappropriately. I like people who don't have all the answers, who are willing to admit that they don't know, and are uncertain about the complex reasons for how we got here, and unsure about the right way out of it. I like it when you burn the toast and spill the wine. I like it when you get ketchup down your shirt. I love the ums and ahs and errs when you speak, the hesitations as you stumble on your words and search for the right way to explain it. It makes me smile when your paintbrush slips out of the lines and the ink dances unevenly over the page. I like it when you forget to clean your teeth. I like it when you forget to put the bins out. I like it when you hit a bum note and still leave it in the recording. I love the distant ambient bleed of dog barks and hedge trimmers, the mistimed snare drum in the 18th bar. I like candles that burn unevenly, flowers that bloom at the wrong time, weather that defies the forecast. I like it when the underdog wins and the favourite is gracious in defeat. I like the excess around the edges and what's missing up on top. I like it when you miss a day. I like it when we have something to discuss. I like unusual, different, unexpected, wrong. 
I like what you did with the place, and I enjoyed how it was before. I like seeing what happens when I start. I like seeing what could happen if I mess it up. I like seeing what might happen if I stop doing it altogether. I like it when you act like an idiot. I like it when you play. I like it when you stop trying to control it all, and I glimpse that sparkle in your eye. I like it when you remind me to stop taking myself so seriously, to stop needing to be right, stop thinking about what's next, and to focus on tonight. I like it when you let go of the person you've been told to be to fit into the crowd, the ransom of perfection, the futile hope it makes them proud. I like it when I recognise my own descent into a rhyming pattern. Especially when I'm able to pull myself back out of it with a painfully long phrase or a word that doesn't quite fit right. I hate it when you're driven to please the wall-building voice, the brutal inner bully, the shadow that digs an empty chasm. I hate it when you stop because the voice became so loud. The fashions and the fads keep us safe among the crowd. Oh no, I've done it again. We are bikes on tram lines. I don't like it when I look into your eyes and see fear, loneliness, emptiness. When there's a sense of longing to be released from the harsh critic that keeps you treading water. I hate it when you call yourself a perfectionist. You're not. You can't be. You're a surrogate prisoner holding the tool of perfectionism as if it speaks of who's within, but it negates the true you. This unattainable ideal of perfection is the opposite of the youest you. These standards are not yours; they belong to someone else, to something else. They're slippy, they're soapy, they're impossible to grasp. These standards are not a route to love or to acceptance or respect. They won't provide the value, the approval, or the worth. They keep you always acting, always searching without rest. They're a winding route away from the person that you do best. I hate it when you act out of hate for who you are, when you paper over cracks and conceal your uniquely pretty scars. I hate it when you fall into the trap of shoulds and oughts. I like it when you love yourself, but not a glass of wine in the bubble bath sort. No, by letting go of perfect. And giving out a laugh, a fart, a snort. I like it when the glint returns to your eye, when you see that the world is what it seems, full of confusing contradictions, successfully unmet dreams, of brokenness and loss, of grief and awkward silences, of humanness, of clumsiness, of trying to work this out. I like it when we pause, when we take a breath. I like that whether we understand it or not, the blood keeps pumping through our imperfect veins, and the air keeps moving past the hairs in our whistling noses. I like it when you accept yourself just the way you are—a perfectly imperfect idiot, just like me. We might say, "I don't care what people think of me," in quite a defensive way. <laughs> I always think, "Of course we care what people think." You know, as social animals with a basic need for safety and belonging,、uh, we care about that stuff. But when we allow ourselves to care about other things more, we can begin to unshackle from the fear and the shame-based responses to other people's judgments and criticism. You know, self-consciousness. Um, is a disconnection from the self, from ourselves,、uh, from our you know sense of self. When we see ourselves through the projected, critical, or ridiculing eyes of the world around us, or, or specific people around us, this comes in different shapes and forms. You know, there's very real ways that we might see who we are through certain cultural lenses. If society judges people based on certain characteristics and lifestyles, beliefs, backgrounds that that we might share. And we're likely to have a self-consciousness where we see ourselves as that thing through the eyes of others or through the eyes of society,、uh, and this can be both 
um, kind of very real and also um, imagined and it can be both at the same time you know self-consciousness is the imagined or unconfirmed view of ourselves through awareness that we are seen by something external through this gaze of something outside of us a crowd another person a camera lens you know it, it causes us to perhaps modify our um, behavior our action our words our whatever in some way because we're experiencing ourselves through this this filter this judgmental uh, critical lens i guess one of the things we can do is, is change the words from caring what people think to caring that people think we can't control what people think but we can control our relationship with the fact that people think of us people are looking at us thinking something of us you know as much as the that there's that quote isn't there of uh, that says um, you'll stop caring what people think when you suddenly realize how little they do think of you um, but there are moments where you know people are looking at you there is the th that self-consciousness is very real so by accepting that people will judge us people will view us through critical um, eyes through envy through disdain and so on we might begin to change our relationship with caring that people think of us. Otherwise, we might stop doing what we love doing. We might not start doing what we'd love to do. And we might shrink ourselves and not contribute to our lives, our relationships and the world at large in ways that we feel calling from that ball of sensation inside us. What's worth more than the fear that people are thinking of us? What would be painful to look back on from our deathbed and think, I didn't do that because I was afraid that people were thinking badly of me. This takes me back to the book, The Courage to be Disliked by Kashimi and Koga, a great introduction to Adlerian uh, psychology, the school of thought developed after uh, Austrian psychotherapist Alfred Adler, who was a contemporary of um, Freud and Jung. And I read the book a number of years ago, and these were some of the notes uh, that I made about it. I've, I've gone back and found the notes because uh, I thought, I think this, this has a relevance to what we're talking about here. Um, so I'd written, some people react to the fear of being disliked by shying away from life. They don't want to draw attention to themselves, so they hide for fear of being judged by others. While other people go the other way. They try to earn the affections of others by sharing anecdotes about their amazing lives, name dropping and showing off their talents. The truth is, neither of these options actually achieves the goal of being liked. They more likely lead to the opposite and accomplish the thing that the person feared in the first place. There is only one option, to act courageously in the right way, deep in the knowledge that we will be disliked, to accept that and to even be mindful of it. I will be disliked whatever I do, so I might as well be me and create the world that I believe in in the process. It's not a case of acting in order to be disliked. It's acting despite being disliked. Being liked or disliked isn't the driving force. Your deeper values and principles and visions are. Preferred indifference. This is a stoic concept. You might prefer things to be a certain way, but ultimately whether or not that occurs is outside of your control. One doesn't want to be disliked, but you don't mind if you are because you have no control over it. In Stoicism, this applies to other things. I don't want to be poor, but I don't mind if I am, because things outside of my control might happen to make it so. I don't want to be alone, but I don't mind if I am, and so on. The pursuit of being liked, being wealthy and being in a relationship can lead to a life of compromised values and integrity. Switch from attachment to self, how others see me, to concern for others, how I see others. We can get confused between self-affirmation and self-acceptance. On the one hand, self-acceptance is acknowledging your incapable self as is when you can't do something. You then move on to do whatever you can and ask, what can I do to get closer next time? Self-affirmation, on the other hand, is entitlement. It's the voice that says, I failed this time, but I was unlucky. I should have succeeded, but was hindered. One cannot change what one is born with, but one can, under one's own power, go about changing what use one makes of that equipment. So in that case, one has to simply focus on what one can change rather than on what one cannot. This is what I call self-acceptance. 
Enjoy not being at the centre of the world. You are not at the centre of the universe. When interacting with people, use this knowledge to move from what will others give me and what do other people owe me to the question, what can I give? This shift in perspective takes power away from fear. If you are but one small part of a wider context, the significance of someone disliking you becomes weakened. Without harmony of life, people judge the whole based on one small part that they see. They catastrophize and generalize. Everything is wrong. Bad things always happen to me. Everyone hates me. This occurs when we place ourselves at the center of the universe. If there are ten people, one will be someone who criticizes you no matter what you do. This person will come to dislike you and you will learn not to like him either. Then there will be two others who accept everything about you and whom you accept too and you will become close friends with them. The remaining seven people will be neither of these types. Now do you focus on the one person who dislikes you? Do you pay more attention to the two who love you? Or would you focus on the crowd, the other seven? A person who is lacking in harmony of life will see only the one person he dislikes and will make a judgment of the world from that. Community is a feeling of belonging, refuge and a sense of it's okay to be here and to be me. We all belong to the community of interconnected life. We are all interconnected even if we don't feel it. Even the hermit lives in a house created by someone else using materials designed and constructed elsewhere by others. It's vital to gain the perspective of universal community in order to contribute to others. It's the root of tranquility and joy. Live a life of your own chosen values. Understand where your own sense of value or worth comes from. Don't be driven by a desire for recognition, whether that is seeking praise from people or avoiding rebuke. These are vertical relationships which are not good for us because when you form one vertical relationship, an unequal relationship. All your relationships are formed that way. Instead, form horizontal relationships, equal but not the same. The more one is praised by another person, the more one forms the belief that one has no ability. When receiving praise becomes one's goal, one is choosing a way of living that is in line with another person's system of values. Praise and rebuke are both the same thing. Neither is good for us. Because ultimately they are both forms of manipulation and control, where the person praising or rebuking is doing so to mould you to their desired outcomes. Your identity and self of, sense of self-worth becomes defined by the other person's expectations and demands for what you should do. Regardless of what you do, it is your being here on this planet in this moment that gives you value. You hold great worth. No matter how great or tiny your contribution may be today, make it real authentic and unhindered by the desire to earn praise. Do it because it's right and enjoy the freedom from being disliked. No matter what you do, people are going to dislike you, so you may as well do something that makes the world a better place. Some really interesting ideas in there. Um, some that you that, that may feel kind of abrasive and like, oh, yeah, I'm not sure. I need to sort of think about that. Um, and and I think, yeah, especially that sort of that last bit about the praise and the rebuke, um, those words sort of uh, manipulation and control, very strong words. And I think uh, it, it might be a, a kind of nicer way of or a gentler way of looking at that is is not um, not as a kind of nefarious or um, malevolent uh, uh, sort of sense that people can manipulate and control through praise and rebuke but that that is just a part of that structure um so when we uh, you know the things that we maybe sort of affirm in others or, or uh, praise in others are going to be the things that they will do more of and so even subtly that sense of um that sense of kind of bringing about more of what what it is that we uh, value in that sense or or despise in that sense is going to happen in the same way if we're driven by the desire to be um to be liked or to be to to kind of earn praise earn approval from other people then that that's going to be a really significant part in molding our behavior molding the things that we focus on 
because we want to um, kind of please that other person or whatever. Um, and we see a lot of these ideas in different schools of, of thought and personal development approaches and spiritual practices. And I wonder what sticks out uh, to you um, when you when you hear those notes that I made. Um, I'm struck by the the distinction again between entitlement and freedom. You know how belonging comes from being part of something bigger than ourselves, not owning something beyond ourselves. And this is a concept that we're going to explore more in the next episode. Um, where we're going to uh, look at some of the takeaways from um, our most recent Cotter session that we had in the Haven about the theme, uh, everything is borrowed. And it's a, a really interesting, um, the, this this sense of like be- either belonging, us belonging to something bigger or something bigger belonging to us <laughs> and looking at that distinction. Um, it's really, really quite fascinating. So self-belonging gives us confidence in how we choose to be, not in what we are allowed or not to be. In the same way, there's something beautiful about getting to know someone over time and seeing glimpses of their weird normality. You know, no one is entitled to those parts of you. Letting your weird out is a choice. In safe environments, when you experience the safety of other people, your weird will probably just start to slip out. When you don't need to be guarded, uh, when you don't need to perform or be a certain type of person, it might be that actually that's where you just become who you are without even thinking about it. And we need those environments, these people, these places. These are really, really important things because our normal weirdness can get locked away. It can get stuck behind the glass. We talked about this in our in our uh, Haven Cotter uh, about blessed. Blessed are the weird, um, that it's okay to keep yourself hidden in certain places and around people you don't want to reveal yourself to. Maybe this is something you need to hear right now because I, I think introverts and highly sensitive people are, are, are told a lot to come out of our shells, aren't we? To open up. Oh, don't don't hide yourself. Come on, re- let, let yourself be free. Let yourself go and, and everything. Um, and I think what I'd say is like no one is entitled to that, to an open you. Um, it might be that right now the place that you let your inner weird breathe is when you're alone in your studio, in your bedroom, in the kitchen, when you're with your pets, whatever. As long as you have somewhere to, to keep in touch with that inner weird, I, I would hate for it to stay behind the glass. But yeah, if, like it, if it feels like, actually, no, I, I don't want to like show that part of myself. I don't want to um, let my in a weird free in this particular place like nobody has a right to that and i would encourage you like when you're with people who you do feel safe around and you do want to connect you know just take a little step and let your weird out amazing things can happen when we share our um you know normal weird with others and it might even unlock them and and give permission to other people to do the same show their side that the, the, those kind of little weird <laughs> idiosyncrasies and things that um, are part of who they are. And we might be able to deepen our relationships with the, with the people who are important to us. You know, it might be exactly what they need to, to, to hear um, and to see in you in order to feel a deeper sense of unconditional true belonging in that relationship. Okay, so we sort of... Uh, yeah, get to the towards the end of this of this episode. I want to share a story that Jacob Norby um, shares in chapter fourteen of of Blessed Are the Weird, which is like a uh, an old parable um, that we were reflecting on in our Cotter session um, and and thinking about the implications of it. Um, so in a faraway land and a time long forgotten, a wise and powerful woman lived by herself in a mountain place. She had a cat and a teapot named Lou. Each year, people would walk for many miles through the snow and wind to visit her, for she'd built her house and lived there quietly, but those who knew it called it the Temple of Dreams. She refused all gifts and rarely opened the door to those who knocked, but they came all the same, because everyone who found their way to the temple was allowed to speak their fondest dreams aloud in the clear mountain air. It mattered not whether the dreams were large or small, only that they were uttered from the most honest place within. Then they could write their heart's desire on slips of paper, fold them into paper airplanes, 
and sail them into the winds that rushed and moaned around the hilltop. The boldest pilgrims would sit there for a long time and imagine themselves as if their very best dreams had already come true. Then they would drink a dipper of water from the spring that always bubbled cold and pure nearby and ring the bell hanging from a twisted pine branch. But one day, a man came knocking at the temple door. His feet were ragged from the journey and his beard had grown shaggy in ways that no one from his village would approve. He knocked three times and looked about, but only heard the sighing wind and an eagle crying in the bright sky. Because the holiday celebrations were occupying all those who lived in the valleys down below, he was alone at the temple door. He knocked three times again, but no answer came from the other side. Since there was nothing else to do, he sat on the stairs and ate a piece of cheese he'd saved in the pocket of his robes. A long while passed, but he did not leave. Instead, he sat and let the sunshine bathe his face and watched the eagle loop and soar above the mountaintops. Just before he would have set about to take his departure, he heard a cat's meow behind the door. It roused him from his reverie, and he sprang to the door and knocked three times again. Not certain he'd heard anything at all, he pressed his ear against the door and listened. When it opened, he nearly fell inside, but caught himself just before stumbling into the arms of the woman who stood within. She stared at him with a half-smile her dark hair falling around her shoulders with a few silver strands gleaming in the sunlight. What do you want? she said. The cat peered up at him from between her feet. What? he said, stammering. He'd expected to leave this place empty-handed after all, but now the priestess stood there watching and he had to find the words to tell her why he'd taken the long journey. What do you want? she said again. He paused and looked down into the valleys filled with mist. He had read many things and studied the teachings of gurus far and near. From then, he had learned that desire was the root of suffering and that he should be happy with what he already had. He looked back into the amber eyes of the woman and said, I don't know what I want. Then that is what you will get, she said, and moved to shut the door. But the cat had crept forward to sit in a spot of sunlight and the woman had to choose between closing this stranger out or pinching her friend's tail. Wait, he said. I've walked many miles to come here, and I won't leave until you show me what must be seen. A teapot shrieked from somewhere inside the dwelling, and she turned. Come then, Lou has called and we mustn't keep her waiting. You can tell me a few things over a hot cup before you go. He followed her into the warm entry, but she'd already vanished around a corner and he could hear her muttering from another room. The cat stared at him while he straightened his hair and robes, then led the way ahead, tail straight and twitching slightly. They always want something, but not this one, he heard her saying to herself as he entered the snug kitchen. She was pouring hot water into cups, steam rising in a cloud around her head. That's not entirely true, he said. I do want something, or I wouldn't be here. It's just that I've become content with my things. I don't know what to ask. She turned, holding a carved tray with little cups full of tea. Come with me, she said, and walked away towards windows that looked out over an infinity of space. Once seated, she handed him a cup with a small bow. So, she said, you know many things, most of them very good. What you don't know is the most important, and it's not something your books have told you. What is that? Why don't you tell me again what you really want? I want everything exactly as it is, he said. I know that life unfolds to give me what is best. That's a lovely concept, but it still doesn't explain why you walked many miles and just ate your last scrap of food on my doorstep. He shifted on his cushion and met her eyes. Well, I have a house and comfortable things... I enjoy my work and appreciate my friends. I have everything a man should want, except, except, she said, tell me the except. Except is everything you have never dared to ask, and in that lie is your destiny, your truth, and your happiness. Oh, well, 
Since I was a little boy, I've always wanted to write great stories. I've wanted to turn the things I saw and felt into words and share them with the world. I want to love a woman who will take long and foolish magical journeys with me. I know this won't make me happy, but she held up her hand. Stop. You know no such thing. It's foolishness to suppose that you can be happy if you don't bring forth that which lies within. Forget your concepts and listen to me now. The priestess sipped her tea. Many people make the journey to this place each year. Most of them never knock, and if they do, I rarely answer. But you knocked three times. You will not be denied. Everyone who comes receives something. Perhaps the journey here alone is reward enough for most. All return home changed because they allowed themselves to ask. We live in a fascinating universe full of mystery and delight. Someone you may have heard of once said, For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Does this ring a bell? He nodded. Good. You're here today to ask. Do that. Understand that what your truest self desires is not only good, but it is also well within your birthright to receive. You are not here today to mull over concepts. You've done that far too long already. Most people who come here ask for things they don't really want. Sometimes they get a version of what they think they desire. But what they don't know is that life serves up for us what we actually desire most, not what our mind has been pushed and tricked into believing. And the truth is, most are simply too afraid to ask for their deepest soul desire. They will settle for a nicer home or a better job or a thousand other wishes that fall short of their insatiable hidden truth. Here. From inside her robe, she produced a small scroll and pen. Take this out to the step. After you've done drinking your tea, write down everything you would see come true in your life from this day forward. Leave nothing out. When you finish, hold it in your hands until you can see yourself in that picture you've created. Unlike the others who have journeyed here, I want you not to throw it into the wind. Instead, feel everything and then ring the bell. Then go back down the mountain and read your own new story every day. For you see, no one is waiting in the wind to make your dreams come true. But everything will come to your aid if you do what I have told you. And so saying, she kissed the man on his forehead and disappeared into some distant room while wind rang the chimes and sunlight turned an eagle's wings to silver in the sky. After a long time, the man made his way to the doorstep and opened the scroll. Across the top, were words written in red. Anything you truly desire is possible. Right. I wonder what you make of that story, what that story says to you, where you're at right now. What part of it might you have needed to hear? What part of it do you struggle to hear? We had a really interesting conversation in our Haven Cotter session about uh, many aspects of that story, and um, not least what comes after except for us? You know, that moment is quite ambiguous. And we had a var- variety of interpretations, you know, when we're the person at the door, you know, we might be, be, we might be there because, um, you know, I know what my except is, but I won't, I, I can't allow myself to have it. Maybe I know exactly what I want, but I, I just, there's, there's some blocker that's stopping me from allowing myself, from giving myself permission to, um, to either admit it or to to kind of go after that desire. Maybe we've uh, internalized those stories, like they talk about those those concepts, those teachings that we might have picked up from, um, whether it's the spiritual uh, or the the self help world or whatever it is that tells us these things that feed us a story about our relationship with desire. Um, it might be I don't have an accept, but I feel like I should, you know, maybe that's uh, where we're at. Um, and it's like, I, I, I don't know what I want. I can't think of an accept, but I feel like I should have one. <laughs> and that's the, uh, the desire is to have an accept. Or maybe I don't know what it is, but I know there must be one, but I can't access it. I'm, I'm here for a reason. I've journeyed to this place. Um, I know there is something that I want, but I, I have no idea what that is. Um, and there is also 
the uh, the interpretation that I mean, there is always an accept, and it's always uh, alive in us from moment to moment. There is always something um, that we need, something that we want, something that we desire. And I want to finish um, this episode with a reflective question in relation to that last point. Um, you know, and, ju- and just to say, like, you know, if, if you're in those other situations where you, you know what that accept is, but you there's something blocking you from allowing yourself to have it, or you don't know, you know there is an accept, but you don't know what that accept is, then that, like, I'd love to hear from you. That's perfect kind of uh, uh, prelude to coaching, um, to be honest, like to just sort of gently um, untangle, um, pull at the threads there. Um, and and kind of figure out uh, what's blocking you from the things that you that you know you want the thing those those points that come up after your accept or uh, what's um, what is sitting after accept that you can't yet see what are those things that you know you desire but you just that your response to what is it that you want you know, I don't know I don't know but I know there is something um, that is perfect for um, uh, some some coaching so feel free to get in touch and, and we can uh, yeah have a chat but yeah I want to finish with this reflective question um, in relation to that that kind of last point of what is alive in me r- right now there is always an accept um, and this can help us to identify uh, what could make things better for us in any given moment and this um, is a kind of uh, I guess a, a gentle sort of meditative thing that I want to do Inspired by the vocabulary of feelings in Marsha Rosenberg's nonviolent communication book um, and the inventory of needs. So if you're in a place where you're able, just take a moment uh, to take a couple of deep breaths and sit and listen for the next few minutes and just give yourself to the words that I'm speaking and allow the ones that, that want to pop up and speak to you to do so. What feelings do you want to experience more of? Do you want to be absorbed, adventurous, affectionate, alert, alive, amazed, amused? animated, appreciative, ardent, aroused, astonished, blissful, breathless, buoyant, calm, carefree, cheerful, Comfortable, complacent, composed, concerned, confident, contented, cool, curious, dazzled. Delighted, eager, ebullient, ecstatic, effervescent, elated, enchanted, encouraged, energetic. Engrossed, enlivened, enthusiastic, excited, exhilarated, expansive, expectant, exultant, fascinated. Free, friendly, 
fulfilled, glad, gleeful, glorious, glowing, good humoured, grateful, gratified, happy, helpful, hopeful, inquisitive, inspired, intense, interested, intrigued, invigorated, involved, joyous, joyful, jubilant, keyed up, loving, mellow, merry, mirthful, moved, optimistic, overjoyed, overwhelmed, peaceful, perky, pleasant, pleased, proud, quiet, radiant, rapturous, refreshed, relaxed, relieved, satisfied, secure, sensitive, serene, spellbound, splendid, stimulated, surprised, tender, thankful, thrilled, touched, tranquil, trusting, upbeat, warm, wide awake, wonderful, zestful, Take a breath, picture where you feel those things. Where are you in your mind's eye? Which of your needs are being met inside you? Now think about where you are in this moment. What need is alive in you right now? Maybe you're experiencing a physical need. Fresh air, food, movement, safety connection with another person. Maybe it's a need for autonomy, to choose your dreams, pick your own goals and identify your personal values, 
to choose a plan for fulfilling those things. Maybe you're experiencing a need to celebrate, to celebrate life itself, to celebrate dreams fulfilled, to celebrate things you've lost. Perhaps a need to mourn, to be grateful, or to grieve. Maybe you have a need for integrity. You need authenticity, creativity, meaning, self-worth. Perhaps it's a need for interdependence that you notice rising up in you right now. You need to feel acceptance, a need to give acceptance, appreciation, closeness, community, consideration, contribution to the enrichment of life, to give yourself to life. Maybe you need emotional safety, empathy, honesty, love, reassurance, respect, support, trust, understanding, or warmth. Maybe you need to play, to have fun or experience laughter. Perhaps you have a need for spiritual communion, to witness beauty, harmony, inspiration, order, balance, or peace. What need is alive in you right now? What can you do to meet it in some way? Perhaps in this moment, maybe later today or later this week. Let the need speak and may your actions give to it. And may this help you be confidently weird in normal ways. And until next time, remember that even when it appears not to be, gentleness is always an option. Bye-bye.